Several developing stories as we come on the air. A community in mourning after three first responders are dead after answering a domestic dispute call. And millions brace for another round of drenching rain on the West Coast. But first, just outside of Minneapolis, two police officers and a firefighter shot and killed after responding to what Minnesota's governor says was a call of a family in danger. Another officer injured. Tributes are pouring in for the fallen and what we're learning tonight. More than 37 million people on alert in California as two powerful back-to-back -back storms bear down on the already saturated state. Powerful wind gusts, heavy rain, and the potential for more mudslides. Our weather team is standing by to time it all out. The outpouring of emotion at Lakewood Church one week after a deadly shooting at Pastor Joel Osteen's megachurch in Houston. New details about the accused shooter. Our team with late reporting. The countdown to South Carolina with less than a week to go until the crucial Republican primary. Former Governor Nikki Haley steps up her attacks on former President Trump as he campaigns in important swing states, the latest from the campaign trail. The growing tributes for Lexi Navalny, the Putin critic whose voice was suddenly silenced, the heartfelt remarks from his wife. The Pennsylvania judge charged with shooting her ex-boyfriend, then trying to convince him that he shot himself, what authorities are now saying. New hope for Americans who suffer from food allergies. The FDA approves a drug that can help prevent severe reactions. The showdown on the hardcore, the NBA's greatest shooter, and the three-point challenge from a giant of the WNBA. And America strong tonight. A young man fulfills a lifetime dream, bringing the stadium to its feet. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this Sunday. I'm Lindsay Davis. We do begin tonight with breaking news. Two police officers and a firefighter killed in a barrage of bullets after a standoff for several hours. They were responding to a call of a family in danger in a suburb of Minneapolis. Authorities say an armed man was barricaded inside a home with seven children, which escalated into an exchange of gunfire. Burnsville police officers Paul Elmstrand, Matthew Ruge, and firefighter paramedic Adam Finseth were all killed by the alleged gunman. Outside of the Hennepin County Medical Center, police officers and first responders saluting their brethren. An emotional scene as their bodies were transported in a procession to the medical examiner's office. The new details coming in tonight. Police say the firefighter paramedic died while trying to aid an injured officer and that the suspect allegedly had multiple guns and large amounts of ammunition. ABC's Morgan Norwood leads us off. Tonight, police swarming this Minnesota neighborhood where they say two police officers and a firefighter paramedic were shot and killed while responding to a domestic incident in Burnsville, just south of Minneapolis. And I need two additional ambulances. Police called to the scene just before 2 a.m. where they say an armed man was barricaded inside with his family. The situation escalating into gunfire. This individual had uh, several guns and large amounts of ammunition. Automated calls warning families to shelter in place. Residents like Bridget Stewart shaken. Violence doesn't have boundaries. It doesn't discriminate. After the incident was over, this armored police vehicle seen riddled with bullet holes in the windshield. Tonight, the community mourning the loss of Burnsville police officers Paul Elmstrand and Matthew Ruge, along with firefighter paramedic Adam Finseth, who police say were killed by the gunman during the response. Another officer, Sergeant Adam Medicott, also injured. Scores of first responders gathering outside Hennepin County Medical Center, saluting their lost brothers. Late today, their bodies transported in a procession to the medical examiner's office. Our families need time to grieve. They need time to be together. We need you to pray for them. That's what we need right now. And Lindsay, that suspect reported dead around 8 this morning. Officials say there were seven young children in the home during that shooting. The youngest, Lindsay, just two years old. Officials telling us tonight they are all safe. Lindsay. Our hearts certainly go out to the families of those first responders. Morgan, thank you. Turning now to weather, California is bracing once again for the second half of back-to-back -back storms with more than 37 million on alert for a flood threat. After heavy rain in Santa Rosa, a tree fell leading to an isolated power outage. Let's get right to meteorologist Brittany Bell from our WABC station here in New York City. Brittany, time this all out for us. 
Lindsay, the worst of the storm that will hit late tonight and it's not going to let up until Tuesday. This is going to bring everything from flooding rainfall, heavy snow, also gusty winds. We're talking about winds that could gust up to 50 to 60 miles per hour and there are alerts for all of the above that cover almost the entire state. So let's time this out. That rain really starts to fire up throughout the overnight hours. Intense downpours continue right around the morning commute and still watching periods of rain Monday afternoon into Tuesday. Now this is something we usually don't see. There's a slight risk for severe weather that includes the Sacramento Valley. There's a potential for wind, hail, even isolated tornadoes. So rainfall totals once all is said and done on the lower end ranging from one to two inches also up to two to five closer to Los Angeles and up to two to three feet of snow for the Sierra Nevada mountains. Lindsay, no rest for the weary Brittany. Thank you. Next tonight, the first Sunday service at a Texas mega church after a deadly shooting there. Pastor Joel Olstein told parishioners that today's services were a time for healing. Last Sunday, a woman opened fire during afternoon services. She died on the scene. What we're learning tonight about the shooter. Here's ABC's Jacqueline Lee. Tonight, Lakewood Mega Church in Houston back open. Fear is not going to win. Faith is going to win. We are going to move forward and see the goodness of God. Oh, I got you. Oh, Resuming services a week after a shooter entered the facility with her seven year old son at her side, opening fire with an AR 15. The suspect, 36 year old Genesee Moreno, killed in the exchange of gunfire. Her son shot in the head and still in critical condition. During today's service, Pastor Joel Osteen becoming emotional. Lord, I, I pray for her family. Lord, I know she was troubled in her mind. And Lord, I know her family's hurting. The Houston chief of police holding a press conference after the church service asking for prayers for the seven year old boy. Bill Samuel, seven year old innocent uh, kid, pray for him, pray for his family. You may not never know the, the uh, true motive. It comes as we're learning more about the shooter's past. Our affiliate KTRK obtaining a series of 911 calls showing Moreno had a history of disturbances with her neighbors. In one incident, asking the dispatcher if she could draw a firearm. And her husband wanted to come on my property. Is it okay if I go outside with my gun? Houston police are still investigating why Moreno opened fire and why she may have targeted Lakewood Church specifically. Police will be releasing body camera footage from the shooting within the next 30 days. Lindsay. Jacqueline, thank you. Now to the race for the White House and the countdown to the GOP's South Carolina primary less than a week away. Former president is back on the campaign trail, making stops in key battleground states. And Nikki Haley is sharpening her attacks against Trump, the front runner. What she says about supporting him if he wins the nomination. Here's ABC's Alex Perche. Tonight, with just six days until the South Carolina Republican primary and trailing from behind, former Governor Nikki Haley sharpening her attacks against Donald Trump. Donald Trump is going to side with a man who has made no bones about his hatred for America. Haley hammering the former president over his relationship with Russian President Vladimir Putin, calling out Trump's silence following the recent death of Alexei Navalny. Either he sides with Putin and thinks it's cool that, that Putin killed one of his political opponents, or he just doesn't think it's that big of a deal. Trump making the rounds in battleground states like Pennsylvania, where he received a mixed reaction debuting his new signature shoes. Wow, a lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotion in this room. Thank you. And in Michigan, acting less like a candidate and more like the Republican nominee. We're going to get this guy out. We're going to change our country. We're going to bring our country back. Last week, the former president spent as much time in a courtroom as he did on the campaign trail, now planning to file an appeal after a New York judge found him liable of fraud and ordered he pay more than $350 million in penalties. The ruling has swung some voters his way in South Carolina. I'm more dedicated to, to voting for him than I was even before. According to 538's polling data, Trump's lead has ballooned to 32 points in South Carolina, Nikki Haley's own home state. Today, Haley refusing to say whether she'd support him were he to become the Republican nominee. The last thing on my mind is who I'm going to support. The only thing on my mind is how we're going to win this. That's a 180 for Haley, who previously said that she would support the Republican nominee, even if it was Trump. Now, Trump this week has at least three events in South Carolina, and Haley will be crisscrossing the state in a bus tour all the way up to Saturday. 
Lindsay. Alex Perche for us. Thanks so much, Alex. Moving overseas now to the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to push forward with a ground invasion of the border city of Rafah. That's despite growing international opposition, including the U.S., to such a move. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Israel continuing its push south in Gaza tonight, vowing to expand its operations in the city of Rafah on the border with Egypt. Where more than half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million has sought refuge from the fighting. The city already affected by the war, an Israeli airstrike there killing at least six overnight, according to officials in Gaza. On the other side of the border, Egypt building an enormous cement fence, which it says will be used as, quote, a logistics zone for aid to Gaza, as officials warn an Israeli operation in Rafa could displace thousands more refugees. <laughs> in nearby Khan Yunus, Nasser Hospital shutting down today after that raid by Israeli forces last week. The Gaza Health Ministry saying Israel has arrested dozens of health care workers and effectively turned the hospital into military barracks adding that seven intensive care patients died due to lack of power. Inside the hospital, the IDF saying they found unused medicine that was intended for Israeli hostages. With Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu repeating his vow to fight until total victory. Thousands of demonstrators taking to the streets of Tel Aviv this weekend to protest his government, demanding the release of hostages. We cannot wait anymore. We have to get them back as soon as possible. We must replace the government right now. And Lindsay, at the same time tonight, Netanyahu and his cabinet uh, unanimously approved a resolution uh, rejecting Palestinian statehood, which is something the U.S. says it supports. Lindsay. Marcus, thank you. The U.S. has launched more strikes against Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. America has conducted at least five strikes and hit an unmanned water vessel for the first time. This comes amid reports that Iran is urging its proxies to dial back attacks on U.S. forces. Sources say Iran is wary of provoking a direct confrontation. Back here at home, a Pennsylvania judge is on the wrong side of the bench, charged with the attempted murder and aggravated assault of her ex-boyfriend. When he woke up, he'd been shot in the head. What she says happened while he was sleeping and the new details about her background. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. Tonight, a Pennsylvania judge on the other side of the law. After police say she shot her ex-boyfriend in the head while he was asleep and then tried to convince him he pulled the trigger. Authorities charging 57-year-old Sonia McKnight with attempted murder and aggravated assault, alleging the violence unfolded after the couple's bitter breakup and multiple requests for McKnight to move out. According to court documents, her ex-boyfriend Michael McCoy suddenly waking up in his Harrisburg home last weekend, screaming, with massive head pain, unable to see. A bullet going through the right side of his face and out the left, leaving him with permanent vision loss in one eye. McKnight asking McCoy, what did you do to yourself? Only calling 911 after McCoy asked her to more than once, allegedly stalling by saying she couldn't find her phone, even asking what's the number to call an ambulance, according to the police affidavit. Investigators say tests revealed gunshot residue on her hands within an hour after the shooting and called her interview deceptive. Back in 2019, McKnight also shot and wounded her estranged husband, but prosecutors ruled it self-defense, according to ABC affiliate WHTM. The Dauphin County magistrate judge elected in 2016 was already suspended without pay in November for multiple pending violations. And McKnight's lawyer telling us tonight that she denies shooting McCoy, is innocent of the charges, and plans on vigorously defending herself. Lindsay? Rena, thank you. Overseas now, and the search for an American woman missing in Spain. She vanished two weeks ago after a man wearing a motorcycle helmet disabled security cameras at her apartment in Madrid, and the disturbing text messages friends received after she vanished. Here's ABC's Lama Hassan with the latest on the investigation. Tonight, growing fears for American citizen Anna Nizovic, missing in Madrid for over two weeks. <laughs> this is a nightmare. It's extremely painful. The Florida native's friend, Sana Ramu, who is also speaking on behalf of her family, traveled to Spain, revealing new details about the evening she vanished. There was a man spray painting the surveillance cameras in her building outside of the front door and inside of the building by the elevator. And 30 minutes later is when she was seen outside of her apartment and no one has seen her since. Ramu says the next day she received two text messages that were seemingly out of character. 
one in English, the other in Spanish, saying she'd met a man who lives two hours away and planned to stay there for a few days. But Ramu and Nizovich's family don't believe she sent those messages and say they haven't been able to reach her since. The messages that we received on that Saturday afternoon was very bizarre. Ramu quickly contacting the authorities in Madrid, police immediately launching an investigation. According to friends, the 40-year-old had been going through a difficult divorce and wanted to travel to explore new countries. Lindsay, Spanish authorities are now treating this as a missing persons case and the U.S. State Department is working with local authorities as they carry out their search efforts. Lindsay? Lama, thank you. Now to those powerful images coming in tonight of memorials for Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Navalny's widow posted an emotional tribute to her late husband on social media saying, I love you. Flowers and messages were left at a memorial in London. One sign read, killed but not forgotten. More than 400 people have been arrested since the Putin critic died in a Siberian prison on Friday. His allies say he was murdered. His family is still waiting for his body to be released. Still much more ahead here on World News Tonight this Sunday. The latest on the deadly dorm shooting in Colorado. What school officials have announced about classes tomorrow. And head to head, how Sabrina Ionescu kept pace with the great Steph Curry. Next tonight, an urgent search is underway in Colorado after two people were found dead in a dorm room at the University of Colorado after reports of shots fired. A suspect is still on the loose. Classes at the school have been canceled for tomorrow. Colorado Springs police say they believe the incident is isolated and there is no immediate threat to the community. The NBA's greatest shooter versus a giant of the WNBA. It happened this weekend in Indianapolis. Golden State Steph Curry just sneaking past New York Liberty guard Sabrina Ionescu in a three-point shootout, 29 to 26. Ionescu's 26 points matched the highest NBA player score in an earlier three-point contest. She was also shooting from the NBA three-point line, which is further away than the WNBA's. Ionescu said she did this to push boundaries and even the playing field, but she hopes the shootout in inspires the next generation of boys and girls to compete. And when we come back, the FDA approves a first of its kind medication for those who suffer from food allergies. To the index now, the FDA has approved the first medication to reduce the risk of allergic reactions triggered by food allergies. The drug Zolaire was already approved to help treat asthma. Studies have shown it can reduce the risk of a serious reaction in people with food allergies that have been exposed to triggering foods. The drug is not approved for the immediate emergency treatment of allergic reactions, and patients are still urged to avoid triggering foods. Former President Jimmy Carter is marking a milestone of sorts today. It has now been one year since the announcement that Carter was entering hospice care at his home in Plains, Georgia. Since then, he marked the passing of his wife of 77 years, former First Lady Rosalind, and he turned 99. The Carter family says President Carter continues to be at home with his family. When we come back, a young athlete, he shoots, he scores, and brings everyone in the stadium to their feet. Finally tonight, America Strong. And a reminder, sometimes sports are more than just the score. Ohio's Middletown High School Senior Night's always special, but this year was over the top. Thanks to the Knights honoree, team manager Luke Atkinson. All four years he served as team manager. And during this week's last home game, his teammates showed their appreciation. Luke donning number 33, getting in the game for the first time on the high school hardwood. And just seconds into the game, Luke shoots and he scores. Running off the court to thunderous applause. Luke, who was born with Down syndrome, learned to play the game from his big brother, Jake. He's been playing basketball since he was six. Here he is making it rain, scoring a three-pointer back in seventh grade. <laughs> Luke's team was victorious that night, which wasn't just evident on the scoreboard. You could also see it in Luke's smile just before walking off the court with his family. Luke with this message about his big night. Hi, everyone. I had a fun singing night with the team. It was the best night of my life. Love to hear that. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Lindsay Davis, GMA First Thing in the Morning. David Muir right back here tomorrow. Good night.
Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.